Welcome my friends! I am so excited because in this video we get to introduce probability. So let's go ahead and get started. Probability is a number between 0 and 1 that describes how likely an event is to occur. You can think of probability on a number line. Events that are less likely will have a probability closer to 0, and events that are more likely are going to have a probability that is closer to 1. A probability of exactly 0 would mean that the event is impossible. It cannot occur. An example of this would be like, an example of this might be the chance of rolling a 7 on a 6-sided die. An event with a probability of 1 means that that event is certain to occur. An example of this might be, if I'm shooting two free throws, what is the chance that I will make either 0, 1, or 2 out of those two free throws? Well, the chance is 1. I am certain to make either 0, 1, or 2 free throws. Another example could be, what's the chance that tomorrow it either does or does not rain? Well, one of those two things has to happen. It has to either rain or not rain. So the chance that one of those two things will happen is going to be 1. A probability of 0.5 means that there is an equal chance that the event either does or does not occur. An example of an event that has a 0.5 chance of occurring would be flipping heads on a fair coin. There are two outcomes on one flip of the coin, which are heads or tails, and since those two outcomes are equally likely, we would say there is a 1 half or 0.5 chance of flipping heads. That is, unless you consider some additional possibilities. So the book How to Lie with Statistics by Daryl Huff had uh, kind of a, an alternative uh, perspective on this. Maybe there's actually four possibilities when you flip a coin. You could flip either heads or tails, or it could land on its side, or... Maybe it could get picked up by a bird, or maybe there's even more options, right? But traditionally, we think of when you flip a coin, there's two outcomes, they're equally likely, so we'd say there is a 0.5 chance or even chance that you flip either heads or tails. Since we're always relating probability to certain events that either can or cannot happen, oftentimes we want to kind of abbreviate those events by using capital letters. So capital letters such as A, B, or C are going to represent events. So you might see in a problem, it'll say A equals that you are going to flip heads on a coin, and then you would find the probability of that, or whatever your event is going to be. There are traditionally three different ways you can express a probability. First of all, you could express that number in decimal form, like we have here. So it's like 0, or 0 0.5, or 0 0.7, or we would also include the numbers 1 or 0 in uh, that type of number. We could also express those numbers as percentages. So instead of saying 0 and 1, we could say 0% or 100% or 50% or any number in between. You could also express a probability as a fraction. So it would be acceptable to say instead of 0 0.5 that an event has a 1 half chance of happening or maybe a 3 quarters chance of happening. So usually in any probability problem, it's acceptable to write your answer in any of these three forms unless specifically requested to use one of these specific forms. This is what we call a probability statement. So remember, we're going to use capital letters to represent events. And the way you would read this is the probability that A occurs is 30%. A is some event, and the chance that event A occurs is 30%. This is not multiplication. P is not a variable. This is saying the probability of the event A occurring, which is 30% if this is the notation we're using. There are traditionally three different methods you can use to assign a probability. So how do you actually come up with these numbers? Well, there's three different ways that you might come up with a probability. Number one would be what's just called either subjective probability or intuition. And this means that the probability that you have assigned to some event is based on maybe your past experience, your judgment, or opinion. So the key with subjective probability is that this is subjective to the person. So two different people could come up with different answers for a subjective probability. An example might be, uh, you could believe that you have a 90% chance of getting a job after a job interview. So you think that the interview went pretty well, you're feeling pretty good about this, and you think there is a 90% chance that you get this job. But maybe the person who's doing the interview has a different perspective and says, you know, I actually didn't think it went quite as well, and maybe they only put the probability of you know offering you that job 
uh, at 30%, right? So this is subjective probability. It could be different depending on the person that you ask. And therefore, uh, we try to, whenever possible, avoid this type of probability and use one of the other two methods. But nevertheless, this is one of the three main methods of assigning a probability. A second method of assigning probabilities would be based on what is called relative frequency. This is based on how frequently an event occurs from a sample of n observations. We would find the probability by taking f, how frequently that event occurred, divided by n, your sample size. The key thing to remember related to relative frequency probabilities is these are always assigned based on a sample. So an example of that could be that we have 6 out of 30 students in a class earned an A. If that was the case, I might estimate the probability that a student received an A in my class to be 6 out of 30, which comes to about 0 0.2. The third method of assigning probabilities is what is called equally likely events. When each event is equally likely, we can find the probability of an event by taking the number of outcomes favorable to that event and dividing by the total number of outcomes. An example of that might be rolling a six-sided die. If you have a fair six-sided die, then each of these six different outcomes would be just as likely. So if I wanted to find the probability of rolling an even number, then I would count up how many even numbers that I have, which would be three, either two, four, or six, and divide by the total number of outcomes, six. Three out of six simplifies to one half or a 50% chance of rolling an even number. Make sure not to confuse equally likely events with relative frequency events. As I mentioned earlier, relative frequency events require a sample in order to estimate the probability, whereas equally likely events do not require a sample. All right, here is a problem for you to try. Were each of the following probabilities assigned using intuition, relative frequency, or equally likely outcomes? Pause the video and give each of these a try. All right, so the next thing to talk about is what is called the sample space. The sample space includes all possible events in the scope of your statistical experiment and is represented by the capital letter S. The sum of all probabilities in the sample space must add up to 1, which represents 100% of the outcomes. Let's write out the sample space for rolling two six-sided dice. This is what the sample space looks like. Here's how you would read the sample space. 1-1 one, one means that you've rolled a 1 on both the first and the second die. 1-2 one, means that you've rolled a 1 on the first die and a 2 on the second die, etc. all the way through the 36 different outcomes. If we assume equally likely outcomes, which is a reasonable assumption, each of those events would have a 1 out of 36 chance of occurring. Let's say that we define the event A as rolling a sum of 10 or higher. Using the idea of equally likely events, we can find the probability of A by counting how many rolls have a sum of 10 or higher and dividing by the total number of outcomes, which is 36. So how many values have a sum of 10 or higher? Well, 6 and 6 would sum to 10 or higher. That would sum to 12. 6 and 5 and 5 and 6 would both sum to 11. 6, 4, 5, 5, and 4, 6 would all sum to 10. So all of these numbers right here would sum to 10 or higher, and none of the other values would. So that means that the probability of A could be found by taking the number of outcomes that are favorable to A, which is the six outcomes that are 10 or higher, and dividing by the total number of outcomes, which is 36. So altogether, we get the probability of A equals six out of 36, or if you'd like to reduce that, you would get one out of six. The complement of event A, represented by A with a superscript C, represents the chance that event A does not occur. The probability of A plus the probability of A complement is equal to 1. For example, if A represents the chance that it rains today, then that means that A complement represents the chance that it doesn't rain today. The chance that it either does or does not rain today must equal 1. One of those two things has to happen, so those two added together is always going to add up to 1. Using some algebra, we can either subtract the probability of A or subtract the probability of A complement to the other side of the equation. We will get two different results. If we subtract the probability of A from both sides of the equation, we will get that the probability of A complement is equal to 1 minus the probability of A. If we subtract the probability of A complement to the other side, we will get that the probability of A is equal to 1 minus the probability of A complement. Collectively, these two formulas are considered the complement rule. 
Oftentimes it's a lot easier to find a probability using the complement rule than finding it directly. For example, say that the probability of A seems to be a very difficult thing to calculate. But then you start thinking about the complement of A and you realize that that's actually not that hard to calculate. Instead of finding the probability of A directly, you can find its complement and then take one and subtract the complement to find the probability of A. Let's look at an example. Again, we have the sample space for rolling two six-sided dice. Let's let A represent the event where the two numbers on the die sum to four or more. Well, there are a lot of values in the sample space where the two numbers sum to four or more, so it might be easier to think about the complement. The complement of A is the event where the two numbers sum to three or less. We can use the complement rule to solve for the probability of A. So first, let's identify which numbers sum to three or less. The numbers that sum to three or less include one one, two one, and one two. One one sums to two, two one and one two both sum to three. So it's going to be these three outcomes. Therefore, we can calculate the probability by taking one minus three out of 36, which comes to 33 out of 36. Instead of counting up all 33 of the outcomes, which sum to four or more, we could just count the ones that don't sum to three or more and take one minus that number to get the answer of 33 out of 36. This number could be reduced, but it's really not necessary. In probability, sometimes keeping the denominator unreduced tells you a little bit more about the problem. In this case, that there are 36 outcomes in total. So I'd rather keep this number as 33 out of 36 rather than reducing this to, what would it be, 11 out of 12. Here's one for you to try. Suppose a fair coin is flipped three times. What is the sample space? I'll give you a hint here. There's going to be eight outcomes in the sample space, and one of those outcomes will be H, H, H for three heads in a row. Let A represent the outcome where exactly one heads is flipped. What is the probability of A? And then what is a complement? So this part just asks you to describe the event a complement. And secondly, what is the probability of a complement? So pause the video and give these questions a shot. All right, hopefully you've given these problems a shot. I'm gonna kind of guide you through to some extent how to complete these if you're getting stuck. So first, listing out the sample space for flipping a coin three times. So kind of the trick that I use here is um, instead of listing out all the outcomes for flipping the coin three times, I'm gonna list them out for flipping two coins and then I'm going to kind of adjust that to make it work for three coins. So if I'm only uh, you know, flipping two coins, I could have either HH, two heads in a row, I could have heads then tails, tails then heads, or I could have two tails in a row. And those are the only four outcomes you could have. Now, if I'm gonna be flipping it three times, then I'm gonna have basically this, but with one more coin. So what I'm gonna end up doing is I'm just gonna list this out one more time. So I've just listed out the exact same thing, but now kind of in addition to uh, this initial two flips, I could have a third flip which could have either a heads or a tails. So the first list, I'm just gonna tag on an H to each of these. And the second list, I'm just going to tag on a T to the beginning of each of these. And there you go, I will have the eight outcomes for um, three flips of a coin. We could have any of these kind of uh, eight different possibilities when we flip a coin uh, three times. And this would be what we call the sample space. Let A represent the outcome where exactly one heads is flipped. What is the probability of A? Well, these are all gonna be equally likely. So all you gotta do is just count how many outcomes have uh, exactly one heads, and then divide that by the total of eight different outcomes. So I will uh, leave that one to you. And then the last one says, what is a complement? So that's just asking us to kind of describe it. Well, a complement, uh, if A represents exactly one heads, uh, then a complement would be uh, represents flipping either zero, two, or three heads, right? So if a, a is just one heads, then a complement would have to be the other outcomes, either zero, two, or three. You can find that by either counting up how many are either zero, two, or three heads and dividing by the total of eight, or you can just take one minus your answer of a complement. All right, so I'll uh, you know, leave you back to that and then uh, we will be moving on. So here's one more question for you to try. USA Today did a survey of 966 inventors. Uh, who hold U.S. patents and obtain the following information. So here we have uh, some information about uh, when these inventors had their best ideas, either from 6 a.m. to noon, 
from noon to 6 p.m., 6 p.m. to midnight, or midnight to 6 a.m., and the number of inventors in each of those slots. So the first question says, estimate the probability that a random inventor has one of their best ideas within each of the four time slots using the idea of relative frequency. Remember, relative frequency just says, count up how many times that something happened and divide by the total. So what you'll need to do is take each of these values and divide by the total of 966, and that will be your relative frequency estimate for the probabilities. And then if, six, if A is 6 a.m. to noon, uh, find the probability of A complement and also describe what it represents. So I will let you, uh, you know, try that out. And I think at this point, I have everything that I wanted to talk about in this video. So uh, hopefully you found it useful, and I will see you in the next one. For example, if A was the chance that it rains today, then that would mean that A complement would be the chance that A does not rain today. <laughs> A does not rain today. What does that mean? <laughs>